Securing Outlook 2003. Becoming a security expert takes years of experience, trial and error, and steady research. In addition, you have to constantly be aware of new threats and new technologies out there. Now, as a security professional myself, with a CISSP certification under my belt, I know this firsthand all too well. But my goal in this nugget is not to overload you with security policies, mechanisms, and methodologies, but rather give you the basic tools you need to immediately protect your data, both stored data and data in transit in Outlook 2003. Believe me, security conscious and vigilant power users are the apple of my eye as an exchange administrator and I'll bend over backwards for these types of professionals professionals just like you in this CBT nugget on securing Outlook 2003 we're only going to cover three main objectives but within these objectives we're going to cover a ton of information first of all we're going to talk about secure message handling in outlook 2003 that deals with things like security zones digital signatures and certificates and more we'll then look at virus protection mechanisms and then finally and very importantly backing up and restoring outlook data securing that data in storage are you ready all right let's do it now, because Outlook 2003 supports HTML messages and the messages it sends and receives, this kind of opens up a security issue for Outlook. So what we have our security zones in Outlook 2003, and the security zones are actually based on Microsoft Internet Explorer defined zones. And we'll look at that here in just a second. And what we use by default is the restricted sites zone. The restricted sites zone is going to stop most of your dangerous actions. Scripts that are going to pull data from your hard drives, uh, delete and corrupt data on your systems, maybe insert a virus uh, into your system as well. It's also going to stop messages from carrying out things like downloading uh, unsigned ActiveX controls, Java applet scripts and active scripting as well. So it really protects you uh, with that feature of HTML and Outlook. Now you can use your custom settings, but for the most part, most folks are going to go ahead and stick with restricted sites in Outlook 2003 because really there's so much vulnerability out there. And realize that uh, you only use the settings in the selected zone, as we'll see, there's several zones with several ways to modify those zones. And one of the ways that Outlook differentiates from IE is the fact that Internet Explorer is going to consider the settings in all of the zones when it determines how it's going to handle web pages from certain domains and from certain security zones. However, Outlook really just uses one selected zone. Let's go look at that area in Tools Options right now. Okay, as I mentioned, the place to go to configure your security zone is up on the tools on the main menu and go to options. And we're going to go to the security tab and you've got a button down here called zone settings. Let's click on that. You're going to get a warning that kind of tells you, hey, you're opening up to vulnerability here. We'll click on OK. Notice that you have four different zones to choose from. The internet zone, the local intranet zone, the trusted sites zone, and then the default that we're using here, which is the one you're probably going to stick with, especially on a home computer uh, and a small office, home office computer, is restricted sites. Now realize that in Internet Explorer, you can go in and you can modify, make custom settings for each one of these zones, and what IE is going to use really is a cumulative effect of all of those zone settings. That's not the way it works in Outlook 2003. In Outlook 2003, I could go and I could modify custom settings in all of these three zones, but if I choose restricted sites, this is the one I'm going to use. In other words, you're only affected by the settings in that particular zone. Now, if we look at the restricted sites zones, and we go to custom level, we'll see here the settings, and the settings are extremely strict. 
you disable all ActiveX controls, signed and unsigned, which means you're verifying that the person who created it is who they say they are, you're disabling all of them, all the controls and plugins. Also, you're disabling file downloads through HTML. Also, accessing data sources across domains, you're disabling as well. If you, if you scroll on down here, installing desktop items, disabling that. And again, you, these are very strict. Software channel permissions, high safety options. If you go to the bottom, uh, no active scripting, no paste operations through a script, no Java applets. And you often see when you go to certain websites, you'll get an error message saying you, you can't support this website because you don't support Java applets or ActiveX controls. You may have seen that in IE. Well, also here, for user authentication, you prompt for username and password. So you've got your settings set to high, and you can reset these to uh, different settings that are kind of uh, opening up your browser more and more, or your HTML options more and more, going from high, medium. And if you choose these, what you're basically doing is you're going from disabling to a combination of uh, enabling certain things and prompting for certain things. So basically what happens is as you move from high to medium, you start to prompt for ActiveX controls, for scripts. As you go from medium to medium low, you start to prompt less and enable more. So you can see that this really starts to open up. Now what I'm going to suggest to you is this. You want to stay with the security zone of restricted sites unless otherwise told by your security officer or your systems administrators that you're going to use either the, the, a modified version of the internet zone, which you'll need somebody to come in here and configure this for you, or if you're not exposed to the global internet, you're just using intranets and extranets, you can use the local intranet zone, which basically allows you to get access to all the content in your organization's intranet. And again, the default here is medium low, which is basically the same, but it doesn't prompt you for things. Most of the content can be run without prompting, uh, but it won't uh, download unsigned ActiveX controls. So this is the best one for your local network without exposure to the internet. Maybe you're going to a proxy server to get to the internet. You could use local internet. Again, on your home computer, small business uh, computer, Soho, you want to stick with restricted sites and use that uh, all the time if you can. Don't open up your, your system to vulnerability. You've also got what's called trusted sites. Click on trusted sites. This allows you to go in and, and, and verify certain websites that you know won't do damage to your data or your computer. And you can click on sites and it basically says with this checkbox, I want to require server verification, preferably an exchange server for all the sites to make sure that they're using secure sockets layering or SSL uh, for their activity. Uh, on HTTP content and other content as well. So I'm going to cancel out of here. Again, the default zone in Outlook 2003 is the restricted site zone. It's very restrictive. Uh, all I would re recommend doing is changing the custom level of this slightly for certain situations and make sure that you have the authority to do that in your organization and that you are working with a security expert to do that as well. I'm going to cancel out of here, and that's the security zones area of tools option. There's a brand new feature in Outlook 2003 that really helps you deal with all of the overwhelming spam, uh, not the meat byproduct, but the spam of sending uh, unwanted email to your inbox out there on the internet. This is a huge problem. What Outlook has done it gives us a feature that actually blocks external content from HTML messages by default. De generally, pictures that are attached or included in uh, HTML messages, and it just puts a red X there instead. And these are pretty strict settings. If you go to Change Automatic Download Settings, you can see here what we're doing is we're not downloading pictures or other content automatically in our HTML email. That's the default setting. Now we'll allow certain downloads, but we have to add them to the safe senders and safe recipients list in our junk email filter. We'll look at that filter here in an upcoming nugget. Also, we're permitting downloads 
just from trusted websites. But again, I haven't added any added any websites to that area in my zone. So right now, I'm not going to get any downloads from websites. But I can go add trusted sites into that area. Make sure they're using SSL security. Also, before I edit, forward, or reply to email, if there's any content downloading involved, please warn me to make sure so I can stop my activity. So these are good to help protect your privacy and to help those web beacons out there that are used uh, through email messages that are HTML based of getting your valid email address so they can continue to send more unwanted junk email to your inbox. Okay, that's the automatic picture download settings which, is, which are all selected by default. You want to leave it that way. One of your highest security priorities in Outlook 2003 should be protecting your messages with the digital certificates and digital signatures, making sure that the people that send you email messages are who they say they are, authenticating them, and also letting other people know that you are who you say you are, that they can trust the email messages that come from your account. What we do is we use digital signatures to sign our messages, kind of like on the back of a check, and to verify the authenticity that we are who we say we are, and that nothing's happened to that message in transit. Now, what allows us to do this is the digital certificate. This certificate is going to map the owner's identity to what's called a public key infrastructure. Basically, it's a pair of keys that allow us to authenticate and encrypt that message. You've got a private key that sits on your computer and is basically just one big digital number. Okay, now the certificate itself contains a public key. Then you have to give this public key to people who are going to be receiving your email messages and you want to send them authenticated or encrypted messages. That way they can kind of unlock this particular digital information. Now the certificate stores this encrypted information itself. The certificate's going to have information like uh, your public key, your name, the expiration date of the certificate, and the serial number. Uh, the name of the entity that issued the certificate, as well as your digital signature. And they also have information that's personal, like your email address, uh, your mailing address, the country you're in, uh, your gender, uh, things like that. Now, the dynamics of how this process works is well beyond the scope of this nugget. Uh, if you look at my Exchange 2003 nugget, uh, I've got more information on how to create this certificate service on your Windows 2003 server and Exchange server. But CBT Nuggets has tons of security-related nuggets to help you explore this area of your career. Now, the first step in Outlook 2003, really, is to get a certificate. And there's three ways to do it that I'm going to mention. First of all, you can get a certificate from an enterprise or standalone certificate authority. This is generally a Windows 2000 or Windows Server 2003 that has the certificate services installed and can issue certificates to the organization. Or you could go to a public authority like VeriSign or Thought. You could go to one of those websites and you could get a personal certificate or a personal digital ID for your Outlook 2003 account. There's also a Get a Digital ID button that Microsoft provides, and I'll show you that, take you to Microsoft's website. We're going to look at all three of these methods. Let's start at the bottom here, first of all, getting one from an enterprise certificate authority in your organization. One way to get a certificate is from a certificate authority in your organization, either an enterprise or a standalone CA. In this situation, if I'm using Windows Server 2003, most likely I've already been auto-enrolled as my user account mshannon at nuggetlab.com. So I'll get an email from an Exchange administrator or from a server administrator uh, with a URL or just telling me to go to my browser and type in http colon forward slash forward slash a server, which in my case is nugget1, forward slash cert serve this directory. Once I get there, I'll get to the Microsoft Certificate Services, a Nugget Lab certificate. This has already been set up on the server side in Windows Server 2003. Setting that up is beyond the scope of this nugget, of course, but you can find that information in my uh, Exchange 2003 nugget. It goes step by step in how to do that, or just go to Microsoft.com. If I go down here, I want to request a certificate. 
When I do, I basically only have one choice, user certificate. Now, I've already been auto-enrolled, so when I choose this option, there are basically nothing else to do. I just click on the Submit button, and I'm going to submit it, and it'll take me a little bit of time, but I'll eventually get a new certificate. And it says it's going to request it on my behalf, and uh, do I want to request it? Click on Yes, and that's all I've got to do. If I go back into Outlook 2003 and go back up to Tools Options, I'm going to see on the Security tab at the bottom here, it's going to say Digital IDs or Certificates. These are documents that allow you to prove your identity in electronic transactions. So all I do is just click on Get a Digital ID, and I'll go to the Internet uh, courtesy of Microsoft. As you can see, when I click on that button, I go to Microsoft Office Online, and it helps you find services that issue or use digital IDs. And they give you a couple of here. Uh, My Credential from Geo, uh, GeoTrust Incorporated, a personal digital certificate. Also, uh, you've got VeriSign as well. Uh, you can also go directly to the website of VeriSign, or one of my favorites is thought, T -H -A -W -T -E dot com. And that's the one that I personally use uh, on my personal machine at home. Uh, let me go run to that website real quick. Just go to the URL www.thought.com, and on the products link, you want to choose Get Personal Email Certificates. Choose that option. and you just join, you log in, and you get a Thought personal email certificate to allow you to secure your email by digitally signing and encrypting your email. It's absolutely free, and again, all you're going to have to do is give some personal information to authenticate who you are, and you'll go through a series of email confirmations, and then you'll have that capability, and they walk you step by step on how to integrate that Outlook 2003, Outlook 2002, or Outlook Express, uh, they give you the steps to do that. So three ways to get a digital ID. You can go to your certificate authority in your organization, as I showed you. You can click on the Get an ID, Digital ID button on the Tools Options Security tab, and you can get that website, or you can go directly to thought.com or verisign.com. All right, great job. Okay, now that I have a digital certificate assigned to my user account and installed, I'm ready to go and digitally sign my email messages for security. I can go up to New and create a new mail message. I'm going to send this to Brian, and the subject is, we'll just put confidential, and maybe something that's just between he and I, something like the eagle has landed whatever, maybe put an attachment on it as well. Either way, I'm now going to go up to the Options button here and choose that Options button. In the Message Options, the area I want to choose is the Security Settings. What I want to do is I want to add a digital signature to this message. I can send this message as clear text but signed with a digital signature and make sure it's authentic for me. I can also request a secure MIME receipt for this message as well from Brian. Now what I want to do here is click on change settings. I'm going to use, I can use the automatic settings just fine, but I want to show you this area. Under change settings, the uh, cryptography format is secure MIME. -E. But notice the signing certificate, it's kind of grayed out here, but it says users. That's the certificate I just installed just a while ago from my certificate authority, my enterprise root CA in my Exchange organization on my Windows Server 2003. I'll click on Choose, and it shows you right here it was issued to Michael Shannon by Nugget Lab. It's intended for encrypting, and if you scroll over here, the expiration is one year from today. I can actually view the certificate, and you can see I just got it, 6-8-2004 and it says it protects my email messages issued to me. It's Nugget Lab certificate. Oh, and I have a private key that corresponds to this certificate. It's on this particular system. I'll click on OK, and I'll OK out of here. Close this. Now I'm ready to send the message, and it's digitally signed. It's as simple as that.
I'm over in Brian Cuban's Outlook 2003 profile. You can see he got an email message from Michael Shannon. It's got this special little icon on to show that it's actually digitally signed email message. Over here in the reading pane, you can see I've got a little button. Digital signature is trusted. Click here for details. You can click on that and you can get information about this particularly digitally signed message. Under details, you can see this, uh, who the signer is, and other information as well. Uh, the Trust Certificate of Authority, click on that, Nugget Lab Certificate, view the authority, and there it all the information is right there. And you can get handy access to that just by clicking on that button. Very cool. Open it up. You've also got that little message right there in that button as well. So you can see from the recipient side what happens uh, with Brian Cuban when he receives a signed message. Excellent. Now, you know what? I may not want to do that for every single message that I send uh, individually. I may want to do some global options, and I can do that by going back up to Tools, Options, back to our Security tab, and notice up here I've got some encrypted email options. First of all, I could choose Encrypt Contents and Attachments for Outgoing Messages. If the majority of my messages that I send need to be encrypted, in other words, scrambling up the text of the message, I can send that to encrypt all my outgoing messages automatically. And then if I want to, I can override that for a particular message just by uh, changing the properties when I compose it by going up to that Options button. But if the majority of my messages uh, need to be encrypted, I'll choose this option. If not, let's go ahead and leave that blank. I can also say, let's add digital signatures to all my outgoing messages. I just did it to that one message to Brian. This does it to all of them. If most of my messages had to be signed, then I could choose this checkbox to digitally sign all of them. If most of them aren't going to be signed, then of course I need to clear this. And remember, the person you're sending this to has to have the public key that you're using to digitally sign this. So they need to be using also some type of certificate authority as well. Now, the default setting when you go here is send clear text signed message when sending signed messages. So basically that just says if you're going to send digitally signed messages to people who don't have that s mime capability, then you'll choose this and it'll send clear text digitally signed messages by default. And again, you can also override this as well. I also saw earlier the option to request an S-MIME receipt, and again, this right here is a global option that does it basically for all the different users. Again, the default settings shows my S-MIME settings, my user account. Click on the settings button, and lo and behold, you're right back to that area uh, that we just looked at where you can choose your signing certificate. It also shows the algorithms, the mathematical algorithms that are used as part of your public key infrastructure uh, for encrypting, uh, hashing your particular message, and the encryption algorithms. These are very strong encryption mechanisms. This button down here, Publish to GAL, Publish to the Global Address List. If you're an exchange organization, you can publish them to the Global Address List, and it makes them available to other uh, users of Exchange Server in your organization. And if they need to send you encrypted messages, they can easily go ahead and just download your published digital ID or certificate and then it makes it easy for them to send you encrypted messages and receive messages. And this is uh, an alternative to literally having to send other users a copy of your, your certificate. For example, if you were going to use that thought.com or verisign.com, you would have to send to your particular recipients copies of that certificate so they can receive that encrypted and digital signed email from you. So you kind of have to manually go through the process of alerting all your users that you're going to be using Thought or VeriSign. They need to participate with you and your certificate authority. So this is a great way to do it in an exchange organization to publish it uh, throughout the organization. All right, great job. I'll click on OK virus protection measures. And we're talking about viruses here, we're really talking about three kind of categories of malicious code. Viruses, worms, and Trojan horses. Let me define each one of these for you real quickly. 
A virus is basically a chunk of executable code, which can have several different file extensions. It attaches or it latches onto files or different applications on your system. It's going to replicate and then proliferate from host to host, from computer to computer, all over your network. Now realize that a virus is going to require a host computer or a host application and along with that replication and damage, it can also deliver a payload, which is a chunk of data as well. But it usually is more nefarious in the sense that it just consumes bandwidth, network bandwidth utilization, memory address, uh, memory addresses, and disk storage. That's a virus. A worm is like a virus in the sense that it replicates, but it doesn't have to have a host program or a host system. It generally does its damage whenever the operating system or a particular application uh, starts to copy or transfer data. Worms are uh, much more popular and much more prevalent now, and they're also extremely dangerous uh, out there in the world of the global internet. The third major category is a Trojan horse. This particular type of program is going to masquerade, it's going to hide itself as something harmless, uh, like a system tool or a system file or a game, but it's potentially dangerous. Generally, it's going to come through your email as an attachment. Uh, you can also have these on floppy disks, but the thing about a Trojan horse is it doesn't replicate like a worm or a virus. It does specific damage to an operating system or parts of an operating system. Trojan horses. Beware of geeks bearing gifts. Here are some best practices as they relate to viruses and virus protection in Outlook 2003. The bottom line is it's best to use server-side solutions. Virus software on your uh, servers, your Exchange servers, uh, your Windows servers, and the routers that are at the edge of your organization. Blocking viruses and worms uh, between your local area network and the internet. You also want to develop a proven strategy. Now it's very likely that as an end user you may not be on the team that's responsible for implementing security, but the bottom line is this. You want to make sure that whatever strategy is implemented, whatever rules are put in place, whatever policies and procedures there are for security, make sure that you diligently follow those rules for your organization. Do not be the security weak link of your company, of your business, of your organization. If you're dealing with your home system or a small office, home office, or even your laptop or business computer, make sure you follow up on your client solutions, adding client solutions to your laptop, to your workstation, to your home PC. These are client solutions that are available, and I'm going to show you a website here in a minute uh, that Microsoft recommends is the place to go to look at uh, comparable and compatible of antivirus software. When you choose your software, three criteria here. Number one, does the product scan many known file types? Number two, are regular updates freely available over the internet? And three, can these updates be automatically scheduled and executed on your system without you having to manually take care of this. You're busy enough as it is. It's nice to have software that will automatically execute this on a scheduled basis, checking the website and then adding new updates as they become available. Also realize that by default, when you're using the restricted zone option that I showed you earlier, uh, Outlook's going to automatically block many attachment types and just show an attachment with a message uh, on your inbound email. So you've already got some built-in stuff. Let me show you some more resources here. Here's three great websites to get more information uh, dealing with uh, specifications for security software vendors. These are kind of open universal standards. TrueSecure.com, ICSA.com, and Checkmark.com. Also a very important website is here at Microsoft.com forward slash exchange, forward slash partners, forward slash antivirus.asp. Let's take a look at this. This is really the seminal uh, website for antivirus software as it relates to Microsoft. Here's the website, the Exchange Partners Antivirus. This page lists a wide variety of supported uh, antivirus partners. Uh, you can see here an old employer of mine, Computer Associates. 
Uh, scroll down, you can see other companies as well that are all supported by Microsoft, have agreements with Microsoft, McAfee, another big one. And uh, so come to this website for your organization. This should be part of your security policy, uh, part of the security team decisions. What vendor are you going to use? And use some of the guidelines I gave you. There's a big one, Symantec, uh, that I gave you to help you determine what's the best antivirus software for your organization. Another important website in your arsenal is the Microsoft Security Notification Service. Uh, here's the URL right up here. I'm going to take note of that. This is a free service you can register for at Microsoft. Uh, it gives you information about the security of their products, any uh, holes that are out there, anything that's uh, out there as far as malicious attacks against Microsoft software. So make sure you have this website as one of your favorites and that you go ahead and join this security notification service. The main website for Microsoft Security overall, not just with Exchange, is the Microsoft.com forward slash security site. And again, always a very up-to-date alerts and updates up there about some of the biggest vulnerabilities out there, some of the biggest and malicious attacks that are going on with Microsoft systems. And here's one, of course, uh, for example, the My Doom virus alert. You know, it's very easy to get in the habit of dwelling on protecting our data in transit uh, from malicious users outside of our organization and inside of our organization or protecting our data in storage by keeping that password and our username uh, as secret as possible and protecting it by encrypting it. But you know, we also have to protect our data and keep it secure uh, in case of a system failure or a hardware malfunction or corruption. So we want to back up our data on a regular basis. That's often part of a organizational security policy as well. There's really three main ways to back up Outlook data. You can use a third-party backup program or the Windows Backup.exe program that comes on your particular operating system. You can export to a personal folders file or a PST file, or you could copy a PST file like, let's say, archive.pst to another disk, preferably a server disk share somewhere in your organization so that a network or a server administrator can also back that up as part of their backup uh, utility and their backup strategy so they have it in a tape archive. Let's look at these options. Now, as we know, I'm logged in as Michael Shannon. I'm using an Exchange client account, so I know that my data store is actually up on an Exchange server. However, there are some key files I might want to back up locally uh, some PST files, other OAB files, uh, XML files, DAT files that are part of a couple of the directories that I want to add to a local backup. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to use the Windows Backup Utility. I'm going to back these up to a network share so that an Exchange administrator can also back these up or a server admin can back these up to a tape archive as part of their backup strategy. So I'm going to show you where to go to do this. I'm going to click on Start. And I'm going to go to All Programs on my XP machine, go to Accessories, and I'm going to choose System Tools, and I'm going to choose the Backup Utility. Again, this is part of my security policy. I'm going to get a wizard, the Backup and Restore wizard. I'm going to go ahead and click on Next. I want to Backup Files and Settings. I'm going to choose what I want to back up. I want to go to my computer. I'm going to expand this out. There's two locations I want to go to on my local disk. And again, I have a bunch of profiles on this particular workstation. But I'm logged in as mshannon at nuggetlab.com. So I want to use that particular profile. The first area I want to go to is under Documents and Settings. And you'll see a profile down here. It's uh, mshannon.nuggetlab. That's the one I want to use. So I'm going to expand this out. The first place is going to be under Application Data. Microsoft, I'll expand that out, and I'll scroll down, and there's an Outlook folder there. That's the first location. That has a couple of DAT files and XML files, some generic files for my actual program. Scroll down. I'm looking for local settings. I'm going to expand this out. Another application data folder in my local settings. Under Microsoft, again, there's Outlook. Now, the contents of this one are pretty beefy. Let me show you what this looks like. This is this folder right here. You can see the path. 
that's local settings application data Microsoft Outlook. It's got PST files and it. it's got the archive.pst file there. It's got a mailbox and Outlook OAB files. It's got a PST file, other OAB files. We'll talk about uh, offline files a little bit later on in this Nugget series. So also my IMAP remote account. So several important files in this particular location. So make sure that you choose those two locations on your system and then click on Next. I'm going to go ahead and not back up to a floppy disk. It wouldn't fit, but if I have a uh, attached zip drive or a recordable CDR or a rewritable CDRW drive, um, you know, other kinds of attached drives, I'm going to go ahead and use that. Even a separate physical uh, hard drive would be fine. But I'm going to go ahead and browse and find a network share and put it up on a server so that my administrator can back that up onto tape in a tape archive. And I've got a share here on Nugget 1 called Backup PST. I'll open that up. Now the file is just called Backup. I can uh, rename this, maybe date it, for example. It'll already have date and time stamping on it so that I can use it to if I have to restore my system crashes, for example. Uh, Outlook just totally gets toast. I need to uh, restore this using the restore utility here. Uh, I can just use this. I may go ahead and just overwrite this existing backup that's sitting there. Remember, these are just a bunch of files. I'll click on Save. Choosing a place to backup. It's a WAC WAC. This is a uh, universal naming convention. WAC WAC Server Nugget 1, and then the share is Backup PST. I'm naming this Backup Backup. Click on Next, and then we'll finish. And the file is called backup.bkf, created this uh, date and this time, and I can use this through my restore process. I'll close this down. Now if I go back to uh, Start menu, and I go up to All Programs, Accessories, System Tools, Backup, if I want to restore from that backup file, I'll just choose Restore Files and Settings, click on Next, Choose the option to click on Next, and I can restore this particular file back to my computer. It's as easy as that. Now I'm back in the Backup and Restore Wizard. I'm going to choose this option right here. Instead of going through the, the Wizard menu, I'm going to go Advanced Mode. I'm going to make sure that you know about the scheduled jobs. Not a bad idea to come in and schedule this particular backup of your Outlook data maybe every day, every couple of days, and it's got a nice little way to go through here and just add a job, and you can add it, and it, you choose the day, and you go through and you pick the files you want to back up those two locations, those two Outlook folders in your local system, and back those up to your tape, back them up to a zip drive, to another physical disk, to a network share, and schedule this on a daily or every other day basis. Now realize you can copy messages and other aspects of Outlook 2003 into an existing PST file or a new PST file. And what's different in this process than backing up is this lets you choose which particular items you want to export and which things you want to exclude from the export process. You can use this uh, regardless of whether you're on an Exchange server environment or whether you're just using a, a collection of personal folders. Now you already know how to use the auto archive feature. I showed you this earlier to move messages out of your message store and store them into another PSD file. But we can also use the import export wizard to export messages to a file. And when you use the wizard it's basically uh, a lot like the auto archive, but the big difference is that when the messages in the store are exported, they aren't removed, they're just copied like they would be during a backup. To do this, I'm going to go up to File on the main menu, and I'm going to choose Import and Export. I'm concerned with exporting right here. I'm going to export to a file, click on Next, and I have several options comma separated values in Windows. Maybe I want to use this information in a spreadsheet or maybe some other kind of third-party spreadsheet. But I can also specify to go ahead and export this to be compatible with Access 
or Excel, or very commonly uh, go ahead and export this to a PST file. And you may have to do this if you're going through a migration process in your organization, let's say going from Exchange 55 to Exchange 2000 or Exchange 2003, it may be necessary an admin might have you go ahead and export this to a PST file and then share that file or put it up in a server share so they have that as part of the process that they go through in migrating from a previous version of Exchange to a recent version of Exchange. You also can export to tab values for DOS or tab values for Windows. Let's go ahead and export to a personal folder file. Then, of course, this is the advantages to using the export option. Instead of going and doing an entire backup or an entire archive, what you can do is you can pick and choose areas of your mailbox. You can pick and choose areas of your archive folders, areas of my IMAP remote account, and areas of the public folders as well. So you can get really granular. If I just want to go in and back up my family and golf options, I can do that. Or maybe just my calendar. Just click on Next. I can say, if there's any duplicates, do I want to replace these, or do I want to allow duplicate items, or don't export duplicate items? Let's go ahead and, for safety's sake, allow duplicate items, and click on Finish. This is going to show you, by the way, where this file is going to. It's going to that location. Let me just give you the whole path here. Documents and Settings, Application Data, Microsoft, Outlook, and it's called Backup.pst, or I could browse and I could save this up to that network share that I mentioned earlier. I showed it to you. If I can find that network share on my network places. Now I've got export04.pst saved on Nugget One server in that backup PST folder. And I'm exporting this, click on finish. And it gives me some options here. Do I want to go ahead and encrypt this? Do I want to apply a password to this PST file for security's sake? Uh, this wouldn't be a very bad idea to do this, really. But I'm going to go ahead and click on OK and keep the default settings. In this CBT nugget on securing Outlook 2003, we covered three main areas. First of all, we looked at several things about Outlook 2003 for secure message handling. We also talked about virus protection, gave you some good guidelines and some good websites and resources. And then finally, backing up the two main areas of Outlook with the backup utility from Windows XP or Windows Server. We also looked at the import and export wizard that you can also use for backing up Outlook 2003 as well. I hope this CBT nugget's been informative for you. I want to thank you for viewing.